How will your life change? How will the United States be different after the dollar loses reserve currency status? I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the world's largest economy, or maybe better said, what will be the world's largest economy in the future. We've got a chart going back to 2010 all the way to 2034. This red line indicates what is projected to be China's GDP in real terms, in dollar terms as well. And we've got the blue line is the United States. So we start off with about $15 trillion in GDP and China, maybe around six or so, this was back in 2010. And we're going up slightly in the United States till we get to the cervasis sickness, and then we have a dip down, and then we continue up, but at a lower trend. With China, they flatline or go down, and then they are projected to go up at an even steeper trajectory. But I'd like to point out that these projections really don't include 2021 and 2022, because we see China right now locking down to a greater degree than they did possibly back in 2020 during the beginning of the Cervasa sickness. So I would argue their economy isn't going to flatline. It's going to go down to a significant degree, especially in 2022. But then it's going to rebound. And then I would imagine, I think my base case is that the Chinese economy is definitely larger than the U.S. economy in terms of real GDP denominated in dollars moving into 2030 and definitely by 2035. Now, one thing that I think gives this a higher probability of coming to fruition that a lot of people really don't talk about or they haven't thought it through is the fact that every time in the United States we have a crisis, the growth trend goes down. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go all the way back 1980 to 2008. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of real GDP growth in the United States. Look at what happened in 2008. Although we did rebound and start to recover, the trend line for growth was a lot lower, meaning we were growing at a much slower rate. And the projections are for us to grow at an even slower rate now in 2022, moving into the future. But if we think about where we would have been if we would have just stayed on the same growth rate or the same trajectory from 1980 to 2008, moving out to 2035, I think that if you just keep that trend going in the same direction, our GDP would still be much, much higher than China. But unfortunately, the policies that have been implemented by our central planners in the United States and the West, every single time we have a crisis, in an effort to just prop things up, make things far worse in the future. Now, a lot of you watching this video right now may say, yeah, George, I get it. I mean, everyone's been talking about this, and I realize that China might have a bigger economy or more GDP in 2035. But what, what does that really matter? Well, you've got to think about the network effects. And we're going to talk about this in step number two. The country with the biggest economy most likely means that they're going to be doing business with a lot of countries throughout the globe. And therefore, those countries are going to want to do business with them, or they're going to want those countries <laughs> to do business with them in their local currency, which doesn't necessarily mean there's a 100% guarantee of the Chinese yuan being the global reserve currency, let's say in 2035, but it definitely gives it a lot of tailwind. But let's bring it back to the topic at hand, and that is the dollar losing reserve currency status. And how will your life change? How will the United States, how will the West change as a result of this huge tectonic shift in the global monetary system? Well, most of the pushback that you'll get for China being the largest economy, say in 2035, is that this will never happen because they have a huge demographic problem. Now, it is true. They have a demographic problem. They made big mistakes back in the 70s or 80s or whenever it was when they had this ridiculous one-child policy. But I want to point out 
that they have over 250 million people between the ages of zero and 14 right now. In fact, based on these numbers, I would imagine that they have more people under the age of 20 than we have total people right here in the United States. Another argument you'll hear is that even if they have the world's largest GDP, it doesn't matter because their per capita GDP is a lot lower, meaning the United States, the individuals are still far richer. But this argument really doesn't hold a lot of weight because right now, as an example, the US per capita GDP is about 59,000 per year. Luxembourg is about 105,000 per year. Now, which country is the superpower? Is it the United States or is it Luxembourg? <laughs> An obvious question, I know, but what it points out is what really matters is the largest GDP. That's the country that's going to have the most power at a global level. And that's whose country's currency will be taking more and more market share away from the dollar until the dollar loses its reserve currency status. Step number two. Now let's discuss when your life will start to change and when you'll start to notice differences in the United States and in the West. And to get our head around this, we've got to go back to what we were saying in step number one about the global reserve currency being a network. It's just like MySpace or Facebook, a social network. And if you go back to, what was it, 2005, uh, 2006, when a lot of us were on MySpace, and then you remember the transition over into Facebook. And then once everyone got over to Facebook, then the young people started to say, well, this Facebook thing kind of sucks. So we want something called Instagram, and then you get Twitter, and then you get a more decentralized approach. And then the question becomes, will we move into a world in the future where we go back to there just being one social network because it's so superior? Think about Google as a search engine, as an example. But let's go through this on the whiteboard so we really understand it. So we've got a network right up here. And we'll assume that this is kind of like MySpace. And this is the dollar right now. It's, it's a network between all of these countries, corporations, and global banks. And they're on this system that they've been using, quite frankly, since the mid-1940s, going back to Bretton Woods, and specifically with the euro dollar system, the mid-1950s. So it is really, really entrenched, to say the least. But then you've got this guy that comes along with a different social network. Uh, we will call him Larry, Larry the Loser, <laughs> because initially no one wants to be on Larry's network because no one else is using it. It's this network effect you talk about. So he reaches out to one of his buddies and says, hey, use my network. And this guy says, hell no, Larry. I'm not going to use your network because all my buddies and everyone I know is using this social network. And the whole point of a social network is to have access to a lot of people. Just like the whole point of using a global reserve currency is because you know everyone else is using it and everyone else will accept it. But then the winds of change start to set in. And if there's another driving force other than just everyone using it, such as the largest economy in the planet changing and the largest economy now having a different currency, therefore, if you want to be one of the cool kids, now all of a sudden you've got to start using yuan instead of dollars, then this transitions, this moves more people maybe over to Larry's network. So it looks something like this. You start off with maybe seven people over here, one person over here. But now all of a sudden, you've got five people using the old network and three people using the new network. And when this person is inviting someone over here to go ahead and use this new network, they're saying, yes, I will use that network because I understand the advantages. In fact, maybe I'll even use both networks 
And this is what we're seeing play out right now with social media to a certain degree, because you start with MySpace, then you go to Facebook, and that pretty much has everyone. But then you've got Twitter, you've got Instagram, you've got YouTube, and then it divides down even further to some of these alternative social medias that are popping up right now, like Locals, Rumble, Getter, etc. And it's the same thing that could happen for a global currency. It starts with the dollar and then maybe slightly transitions over to yuan. And at the same time, the dollar system itself is breaking down even further because some people are choosing to use yuan. Some people are choosing to use rubles. Some people, the Indian rupee depends on who you're doing business with. Just like now, the social media platform you use really depends on who you're trying to interact with. If you want to interact with people regarding finance, economics, the news, politics, you most likely go to Twitter. If you want to just interact with your friends, most likely it's going to be Facebook or Instagram. And if you just want to watch something on TV, let's say, most likely go over to YouTube. We could see a world that becomes more decentralized as the dollar loses its reserve status. And maybe they move over to another fiat currency, like we said earlier, or maybe they go to gold, Bitcoin. Who knows what will happen? But the bottom line is fewer and fewer people will use the US dollar. So let's go back to the whiteboard and go over this visual one more time so we can really get our head around kind of what's happening. And then we can discuss how this will affect you, the United States and the West moving forward. Even if we move into a world where there's not a distinct transition between one reserve currency and the next reserve currency, even if there's that interim time when it gets very, very messy, when we're using everything, gold, Bitcoin, other fiat currencies, it's really going to impact all of us. So we really need to get our head around the driving forces. So like I said earlier, it starts off with this one network. Someone else comes up with another network. You transition is decentralized. And depending on whether the new network is better or using multiple networks is best, that's usually what most people transition to. So you kind of have to ask this question, is the new system a more decentralized approach, like I would like it to be, or does it go from MySpace just straight over to Facebook? So I think the next thing you have to ask yourself is what parties have significant influence on what happens in the future? So you've got the banksters, the people we talked about earlier that are part of this euro dollar system. They make a lot of money on keeping that system intact. You've got the geopolitics involved. Look at what's happening right now with Russia, India, Saudi Arabia, and China as an example. Then also you have industry and what are your objectives? We talked about this on some of the past whiteboard videos I've done. If you're a country like China that produces a lot of stuff, but you don't have a lot of energy, you're incentivized to keep a reserve asset that is going to maintain its value relative to the stuff or the energy you need to buy in the future. So that may be gold, where another country that has a different objective may choose to hold rubles, may choose to hold yuan or even dollars moving forward. So to answer the question when, this will start impacting you, the viewer, the United States, and the global economy. Most economists right now are saying the dollar will lose reserve currency status within 20 years. But I would add to that, that although it may take 20 years for the dollar to completely lose its reserve currency status, this will start impacting you right now. The transition has started. The wheels have been set in motion. And there is no going back. I make very few predictions on this channel, but one thing I will predict, and that is in 5, 10, 15 years, we will be using far fewer dollars in the global economy than we are right now. Although the process may be very slow and gradual, I can assure you, you're going to start noticing differences, just like you've noticed significant differences over the last year or year and a half when you go to buy groceries at the grocery store or go to put gas into your vehicle. But more on that 
in step number three. Step number three, changes are definitely coming. So let's go through the pros and the cons. The pro, or one of the pros, to the United States dollar losing reserve currency status is it will bring back a lot of manufacturing. Because if the dollar decreases in value relative to other currencies, then all of a sudden the stuff that we make in the United States, although we make very little stuff right now, but in the future, if we make more stuff, then that will become more attractive on the global market because the stuff we're producing in the United States will be cheaper on a relative basis. So maybe instead of importing all of this stuff from China, we will start exporting more to China, exporting more to Europe, Japan, etc. Right now, the dollar is very close to 100 on the DXY. And this is just simply a measurement of the dollar against a basket of other fiat currencies. But you can imagine what would happen if the dollar went down to 50 or maybe even 30. That would make the US exports very, very cheap. And you may say to yourself, oh, George, that's impossible. It can't go down that much. Well, yes, it can. I'd like to remind you that just back in 2011, the dollar was at 70. So is it any stretch to think that the dollar couldn't go even lower than that, significantly lower than that? in the next three, five, 10 years, especially if the dollar is being used less and less for global transactions. Another benefit is that would create a lot of middle-class jobs. And lastly, the United States wouldn't really be able to throw its weight around like it has since the 1950s. So hopefully there would be a lot less war, a lot less warmongering from the politicians in the United States. On the flip side of the coin, some of the cons would be serious consumer price inflation. And although we would be creating more middle-class jobs in manufacturing here in the United States, this transition period would mean that the standard of living in the United States and in the West would decrease significantly. And the United States would no longer be the richest country in the world. Now, for some people, it's not a big deal. For other people, that would be a really, really big deal. That would shatter their entire worldview that the United States always has to be kind of number one. But unfortunately, there is a lot more downside than what I've listed right here for the United States dollar losing reserve currency status. Let's check out this chart going all the way back to 1950 to today's date, and on the left, we go from 50 up to 250. This is a chart, very interesting. The number of sanctions the US has imposed on other countries since the US dollar basically became the world reserve currency. And you can see back in 1950, we started off, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 sanctions on some countries that we deemed, quote unquote, unfriendly. They were doing some things that we didn't approve of. 1960s kind of goes up. But you can see from 1960 to 1990, it goes up pretty much in a straight line. Now, I've smoothed out the chart. Editor, go ahead and throw up the actual chart. You can see it's far more volatile. But pretty much the same concept here. And that is from 1950 to today's date. It's pretty much gone up in a straight line with the exceptions of 1990 to 2010, but that level was at, let's say 200, or at least above 150, where we started off at like 20 or 30. And then in 2014, it skyrockets up over 250, goes down a little, but with the sanctions that we've imposed recently on Russia, it's still hovering at well over 200. So what's my point? It's to illustrate the fact that when a country has the reserve currency, they tend to use that against other countries. They tend to weaponize that currency. So the question becomes, if the dollar is no longer the world reserve currency, and let's say it's the yuan, will China use the yuan against us like we have used the dollar against so many other countries going back to 1950? To explore this idea even further, Editor, or right to the internet.
Let's start by going over this pictograph from the balance. And this gives us a fantastic visual to really get our head around currently what the United States imports and what it exports. So in the future, we could understand how big of an impact sanctions would have if other countries decided to sanction us. So start by going over the imports currently for the United States, 3.1 trillion, exports 2.5 trillion. Now, what, what is the stuff that we tend to import? Well, capital goods, that would be 678 billion. Consumer goods, most of you guys know that. Industrial goods, automotive, and food, feeds, beverages. So I'm assuming feeds for things like cattle, pork, chicken, etc. So what do we export? I always say on this channel, the United States doesn't make anything. And to be fair, that's not entirely true. But I want to point out that when you look at what we do create or what we do produce here in the United States, as far as goods, it requires inputs from other countries. That's a very big deal. Check this out. So capital goods here in the United States would account for $547 billion of our $2.5 trillion in exports. Things like jet airplanes, robotics, whatever this is, <laughs> messages. We're sending messages back and forth. That's somehow that's a capital good. And this other thing, oh, uh, semiconductors, I think is what this is. Industrial goods. Now, this is energy. This is fuel. Now, keep in mind, we may produce it here. But we import a lot of it as well. We're by no means self-sufficient. Now, we could be if the politicians would just get out of the way. But that's a topic for another video. Consumer goods. But see here, I want to point out that a lot of these, such as, let's say, cell phones, are components that we get in other countries. So we're not producing an entire iPhone here in the United States. I can assure you of that. And then pharmaceuticals. Again, we source a lot of this material from other countries that we wouldn't have if those other countries sanctioned us in the future. Food, feed, beverages. So this is fertilizer, as an example, to grow a lot of the corn or the wheat or the soybeans right here in the United States, process it in the United States, and send it to the grocery store or the restaurant. But again, for those inputs, we're still reliant on several other countries. Perfect examples of this that we've seen over the past couple of years. Just think about these semiconductors. Uh, Ford, they can't produce their trucks because they don't have a, a little semiconductor or a chip or a little piece from Taiwan. So although we export a lot of those Ford pickup trucks, we can't do that if we don't have the components made in a foreign country. Same would hold true for the jet airplanes, the robotics, and several other of the things that we export to other countries. So in the future, I think that our imports and our exports could actually switch. We're never going to get rid of our imports entirely, that's for sure. But if the dollar goes down to 50 or 30 on the DXY like we were talking about earlier, if it's being used less and less and less, well, this gives us an advantage. So maybe in the future, our exports will be $3.1 trillion and our imports will be $2.5 trillion. But as you can see, this doesn't make us entirely self-sufficient. So we still would be at the mercy of another country, assuming this other country had the global reserve currency. Now let's look at some headlines that we've been seeing in the news recently through the lens of other countries potentially sanctioning the United States in the future. Just from yesterday, U.S. warns India faces significant long-term costs if it aligns with Russia. So think about that. Let's say the United States in 10 years wants to do a deal with Canada to get a lot of their potash, a lot of their fertilizer. Well, China, as an example, could say, oh, no, 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 Canada, we don't want you doing business with the United States because they've been bad. And all of a sudden, China blocks the transaction. Number one, how do you think that would impact the United States? Number two, how do you think Americans would feel towards China? 
And to take it a step further, what do you think would happen to the U.S. economy and what do you think would happen to the anger level (laughs) of the average American if it wasn't just a sanction on fertilizer, but it was a sanction on 50, 100, or maybe 200 goods that could come in or out of the United States? Just look at what the United States has done to Iran over the past few decades and just realize that that could be us in the next few decades to come. But I also want to point out, it isn't just about other countries sanctioning goods coming in or out of the United States. It's also China, as an example, having the ability to sanction you. Look at this headline. Putin's daughters were just sanctioned. Here's what we know about them. So think about that. In 10 years, let's say you do something that China doesn't like. Let's say we all have to live under a Chinese social credit score, and they say that you have been bad. Maybe you want to stand up for freedom. Maybe you want to stand up for free market capitalism. Maybe you want to come out and say these sanctions are a bunch of BS. Well, I would be forewarned because they could just freeze your bank account and sanction you out of not only the global economy, but the U.S. economy. The good news is there are a lot more of us than there are global elite and politicians. (laughs) So to a certain degree, a lot of this is in our control. We can maximize on the upside, the pros that we talked about before, and we can really minimize the downside to the transition of the dollar losing reserve currency status. We don't have to have runaway consumer price inflation. We don't have to have a lower standard of living. And we still can be an extremely rich country. And I would argue on a per capita basis, we could be just as rich as Luxembourg, the example we used in step number one. But we've got to do things much, much differently. We have to be more energy self-sufficient. We have to reduce regulations. We have to reduce taxes, and we have to stop treating capitalists, entrepreneurs, and producers as though they are the enemy. And we have to get our fiscal house in order. We have to decrease the amount of government deficit spending. We have to get rid of the stimmy checks. We need to get rid of the intervention from the central planners at the Fed. And we need to increase the amount of GDP or economic output that is coming as a result of the private sector doing what they do well. I've been to over 40 countries in the world, and at the end of the day, I can tell you definitively that one huge advantage the United States has is our entrepreneurs are better than any other entrepreneurs in any country on the planet Earth today. So what we need to do is release those entrepreneurs, take the shackles off of their feet, and allow them to do what they do well. If we stop demonizing them, start encouraging them, giving them the tools and the support they need, we could take this transition or this situation of the United States losing reserve currency status and turn it in to the best thing that has ever happened to the United States of America. For more content that will help you build wealth and thrive in a world of -of out-of-control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. I will see you on the next video.